There are several fascinating theories about what happens to the dead in Christ, sparking many conversations and debates among the faithful. Some believe that these souls receive temporary bodies while awaiting the final resurrection. Others think that these spirits remain disembodied, waiting for the moment of resurrection. And there is a third view that speculates that the dead in Christ are immediately resurrected at the moment of their death, remaining conscious in an intermediate state until Christ returns to establish his kingdom. What will this intermediate state be? This is the great question that continues to intrigue believers. Three main views. First, temporary body. One theory suggests that the physical body we have now is only temporary and will be replaced by a glorified body in the future. Some argue that upon death, believers receive a temporary body. This idea comes from Paul's words. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. 2 Corinthians 5, 4. According to this view, Paul desired to be immediately clothed with a temporary body without passing through a disembodied state. Thus, the process would be an earthly body, a temporary body, and finally a glorified body at the resurrection. Second, disembodied spirit. Another perspective is that believers remain conscious as disembodied spirits, awaiting a glorified body at the resurrection, similar to angels. For many biblical scholars, when a person dies, their spirit enters a state of waiting for the resurrection. This process involves three phases, life in the earthly body, existence as a disembodied spirit after death, and finally, receiving a resurrected body at Christ's return. This disembodied state is considered preferable to the earthly body because the believer is with Christ, but it is not yet the complete fulfillment of divine promises. Third, Christ as the first fruits. The scriptures are clear that Christ was the first to receive a resurrected body. Paul wrote, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits. Then when he comes, those who belong to him, 1 Corinthians 15, 20, 23. This means that just as death came through one man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through one man, Christ. In Christ, all will be made alive, but each in turn, first Christ, then the believers at his coming. In the future, the righteous will receive their permanent bodies. If the saints receive their glorified bodies at death, then figures like Abraham and Moses would have been resurrected before Christ, which contradicts the scriptures that state Christ was the first. Paul explains that our physical transformation is a future event, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 17. He describes this instantaneous transformation as in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Christ will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body, with the power that enables him to bring everything under his control. The righteous do not receive their permanent bodies at the moment of death. They wait until the coming of Christ to be resurrected. This implies a period of waiting between death and resurrection. This extraordinary event will occur in the future at the sound of the last trumpet. Three remarkable events will mark the coming of the Lord Jesus. First, a shout of command. Then we will hear the voice of the archangel. And finally, the sound of the trumpet of God. According to 1 Thessalonians 4.16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. 
The arrival of the Redeemer and Judge will be a magnificent event, full of power and majesty. It will be announced by a powerful cry, like that of a king and conqueror, followed by the voice of the Archangel. Thousands of angels will be present, perhaps one of them leading as a general of the heavenly armies, proclaiming the arrival of the Lord. This great Redeemer and Judge will be announced by the trumpet of God, bringing a grand revelation, the coming of Jesus and his angels. When Jesus returns, he will be accompanied by prominent angels. The Apostle Paul, during his brief stay in Thessalonica, taught the Thessalonians about the imminent return of Jesus, something they wholeheartedly accepted. The church in Thessalonica, which Paul commended, stood out for several notable qualities, especially in how they dealt with different situations. However, after Paul's departure, doubts arose about the fate of believers who had died before Jesus' return. They were concerned that deceased Christians might miss out on the glorious and blessed event of Jesus' coming. The following text details the exact sequence of events that will occur during the coming of Christ for his saints. The Bible states that the Lord himself will descend from heaven without sending an angel in his place. This event will be accompanied by a shout, the voice of an archangel, and the trumpet of God. It is widely believed that the voice of the Archangel Michael, associated with Israel, will be a command to gather the saints of the Old Testament. There are various interpretations regarding the meaning of the trumpet mentioned in the Bible. Some believe it serves to restore Israel as a nation, while others suggest it is the voice of an Archangel calling the angels to escort the Lord and his saints through enemy territory back to heaven, the last trumpet and the resurrection of believers. The trumpet mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15.52 is often identified as the trumpet of God associated with the resurrection of believers. This trumpet is different from the seventh trumpet of Revelation 11, 15, 18, which signals the final judgment during the tribulation. The specific trumpet mentioned here calls the saints to eternal bliss. Additionally, it is believed that the bodies of those who died in Christ will be the first to be resurrected. According to 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, 15, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve, as others do, who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep the meaning of sleep in death. The term, those who have fallen asleep, refers to the deceased. In ancient times, sleep was often used to describe death, but among pagans, it meant an eternal sleep. However, Christians used the term sleep to emphasize the idea of rest. Therefore, the early Christians called their burial places cemeteries, which means dormitories or resting places. It is important to note that the Bible never describes the death of non-believers as sleep because they do not experience rest, peace or comfort in death. Although Paul used common expressions of his time to refer to death as sleep, this does not support the false belief of the soul sleep. The idea of soul sleep suggests that the deceased in Christ are in a state of suspended animation, which is not supported by the scriptures. As Christians, we await a resurrection to consciousness, and when we mourn the death of our brothers and sisters in Christ, our grief is different from those who have no hope. Our sadness resembles the feeling of seeing a loved one depart on a long journey, knowing that we will meet again, but not soon. We are certain that Christians who have died still live. Our hope in the resurrection is strengthened by the resurrection of Jesus, which serves both as an example and a promise of our own resurrection. The Thessalonian Christians found comfort in the words, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus, indicating that even the deceased will be present when Jesus returns. 
Paul, when referring to the death of believers, used the term sleep, but he did not use this word to describe the death of Jesus because his death was not peaceful. We read, we believe that Jesus died and rose again. The early Christians, including Paul, had a strong conviction that since Jesus lives and our connection with him is stronger than death, we will also live. Therefore, we do not mourn like those who have no hope. Our hope is solid and grounded. When a sinner dies, we mourn for them. But when a believer dies, we mourn for ourselves. One of the most common Christian epitaphs in the catacombs was in peace, taken from the Psalms. Those who sleep in Jesus are not at a disadvantage. There are various beliefs about the resurrection of the dead in Christ. Some believe that these individuals have temporary bodies while awaiting their resurrection. Others believe they exist as disembodied spirits awaiting resurrection. There are also those who speculate that the dead in Christ are immediately resurrected. However, in God's eternal plan, there will be a day when all deceased believers will receive their resurrected bodies. Until then, we can be assured that they are not in a state of soul sleep or suspended animation. It's crucial to remember that the living will have no advantage over those who have died in Christ at his coming. They will not meet Christ before the dead, nor will they have any precedence in the blessedness that comes with Christ's return. Paul clarifies that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. In 2 Corinthians 5, 8, Amplified Bible, he says, we are of good courage and confident hope and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. We are confident that God will fulfill his promise, even if our bones are scattered to the four winds of heaven. At the Lord's call, they will be gathered together again, bone by bone. 1 Thessalonians 4:17, 18 states, Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Paul says, encourage one another. His main message was not for his readers to seek comfort for themselves, but to encourage one another according to God's ways. When we offer comfort to others, we end up receiving comfort for ourselves. It is important to note that Paul does not seek to directly comfort or encourage his readers, but he urges them to actively comfort and encourage one another. The present imperative emphasizes the ongoing obligation to do this, both in private conversations and in public services. Another fascinating point is the question of the glorified body that we receive after death. Some believe that upon death, the believer is instantly resurrected and receives this glorified body without any waiting period. Biblical support for this belief can be found in 2 Corinthians 5. 1. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. According to this interpretation, Paul teaches that there is no intermediate state without a body after the destruction of our physical body. Thus, believers need not fear being without a body. As soon as our earthly bodies are destroyed, we immediately receive a new body made by God, the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection of the dead is a reality in the afterlife, but it is not visible to the public until the return of Christ. As Paul wrote, When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Colossians 3, 4 Believers will receive their resurrected bodies when Christ comes, not before. Some question the need for this waiting, arguing that believers already conscious in heaven and in the presence of Christ should immediately receive the promised glorified body. What will our resurrected body be like? Have you ever thought about what your body will be like in eternity? Our current bodies, once buried, disintegrate over time, becoming unrecognizable. However, the scriptures assure us that we will be raised from the dead with new bodies. Although the exact experience of resurrection is not fully clear, some points are provided by scripture. In 1 Corinthians 15:50, 50, 53 Amplified Bible, we read, 
I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. Corruption does not inherit incorruption. Here, corruption does not refer to moral or ethical corruption, but to physical and material corruption. Our current bodies, subject to diseases, injuries, and eventual decay, are unsuitable for heaven. Paul reveals a mystery, in the biblical sense, something to be understood spiritually and not through human perception. He explains that our mortal bodies will be transformed into immortal bodies, free from decay. Consolation in the hope of resurrection. While we await this glorious transformation, Paul encourages us to console one another with this hope. He seeks not only to directly comfort his readers, but also incites them to offer mutual comfort. This ongoing obligation to comfort one another is essential, both in private conversations and in community gatherings. When we offer comfort to others, we also receive comfort. This hope transforms our perception of death. Instead of fearing permanent separation, we see death as a temporary pause before a glorious reunion. This allows us to face loss with an unwavering perspective of hope and faith. In God's eternal plan, the dead in the Lord will receive resurrection bodies, and in an instant, all believers will be gathered to meet Jesus in the air. At that moment, all the redeemed who are still alive on earth will be caught up in the clouds, where they will receive their glorified bodies. Paul affirms that there will be a transformation into something different, but what is this something different? The apostle writes, For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. An incorruptible body will replace a perishable body, an immortal body will replace a mortal body. The resurrection transforms us into incorruptible and immortal beings. The resurrection body. We will have a resurrection body similar to that of Jesus, who conquered death and whose body did not experience corruption in Sheol. Psalm 16.10 says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. To be incorruptible means to be free from original sin and bodily decay, while to be immortal means to live forever. Mysteries of the Resurrection There are several mysteries about the resurrected body. For example, when Jesus rose, he appeared twice to the disciples in a room where, as John reminds us, the door was locked. John 2019 reports, On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. John 2026 20, adds, Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Though Jesus' resurrected body was spiritual, it was not devoid of flesh. Thomas could touch the holes in his hands and side, made by the nails and the spear. John 20:27 20, says, Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Interaction with the physical and spiritual. Jesus interacted with both the physical and spiritual realities, with visible and invisible things. Paul uses an agricultural metaphor to explain that during our lives on earth, we bury our natural bodies, and after death and resurrection, we will be raised with a spiritual body. 1 Corinthians 15, 42, 49 says, So is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. 
it is raised a spiritual body, the nature of the resurrected body. To help us understand what our resurrection bodies will be like, Paul offers four contrasts between our current and future bodies, incorruption versus corruption, glory versus dishonor, power versus weakness, and spiritual versus natural. Resurrected in incorruption, glory, and power, our resurrection body will be glorious. While a dead body may be repulsive and unpleasant, the resurrected body will be beautiful and graceful. We will be resurrected at a full and perfect age, without defects or deformities that may render our bodies undesirable here on earth. Consolation and Hope in this grand plan, the living will have no advantage over the dead in Christ at his coming. Paul emphasizes that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 8 says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. We are confident that God will fulfill his promise, even if our bones are scattered to the four winds of heaven. At the Lord's call, they will be gathered again. 1 Thessalonians 4.17, 18 states, Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore encourage one another with these words. Paul encourages us to comfort one another with this hope. He not only seeks to directly console his readers, but also urges them to offer mutual comfort, both in private conversations and in communal gatherings. The ongoing obligation to console one another is essential, for when we offer comfort to others, we also receive comfort. This hope transforms our perception of death. Instead of fearing permanent separation, we see death as a temporary pause before a glorious reunion, enabling us to face loss with unwavering faith and hope. For the redeemed, the promise is certain. We will also bear the image of the heavenly man. Philippians 3.21 reinforces this idea. Who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Since we will bear the image of the heavenly man, the best example we have of a resurrection body is that of Jesus. Jesus' resurrected body was material and could eat, yet it was not limited by the laws of nature. In Luke 24, 39, 43, Jesus says, See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Mysteries of the Resurrected Body The Gospels report that Jesus suddenly appeared to his disciples in a room with locked doors. Luke 24 31 says, Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. Later in Luke 24, 36, 37. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. This ability to appear and disappear, even with locked doors, demonstrates that Jesus' resurrected body was material, but not limited by the same physical restrictions we know spiritual body yet real. Although Jesus' resurrected body was spiritual, it was not devoid of flesh. Thomas could touch the wounds in his hands and side created by the nails and the spear. John 20:27 20, says, Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. This shows that the resurrected body interacts with both physical and spiritual realities. The nature of the resurrected body. Paul uses an agricultural metaphor to explain that during our lives on earth, we bury our natural bodies, and after death and resurrection, we will be raised with a spiritual body. 1 Corinthians 15, 49 says, So is it with the resurrection of the dead. 
What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. The promise of transformation, the promise for the redeemed is certain. We will be transformed. Paul explains that our current bodies are inadequate for heaven. In 1 Corinthians 15, 50, 53, he says, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. He describes the transformation as a mystery revealed by God. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. Comparison of Bodies Paul offers four contrasts between our current bodies and resurrected bodies. Corruption versus incorruption, dishonor versus glory, weakness versus power, and natural versus spiritual. Just as a fish's body is suited for water, a bird's body for flight, and a human body for life on earth, so too will the resurrected body be perfectly suited for eternal life, free from decay and death. It will be like an upgrade, moving from version 1.0 to version 2.0. Glorious and eternal body. This glorious body will not be subject to the weaknesses and limitations we face now. Matthew 26, 41 reminds us that the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. In the resurrection, spirit and body will both be willing and capable of serving God fully. Daniel 12, 2 says, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. The final destiny. Everyone will be resurrected and receive a spiritual body, but destinies will differ. John 3.36 states, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. 1 John 5.12 reiterates, Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. The crucial question is, where will we spend eternity? The choice we make concerning Christ will determine our eternal destiny and the type of body we will have in the resurrection. The New Testament does not offer many details about the form of the dead in the intermediate state, focusing more on the final destination of believers and their glorified bodies. Paul summarizes this attitude in Romans 14, 8. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Ultimately, after death, all believers are with the Lord and enjoy wonderful circumstances. However, beyond that, we cannot be certain about the details of this state. Our society often sees death as the end of our earthly life, which can make it difficult to grasp the concept of heaven. Romans 8.18 comforts us. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. This future glory offers us hope beyond death. An intriguing example of how different cultures deal with death is the discovery of the terracotta army in China. Archaeologists unearthed over 7,000 life-sized clay soldiers, equipped with war chariots and weapons, buried to protect the tomb of the first emperor of China, Qin Shi Huang. This discovery reveals the belief that death is a battleground, with the emperor seeking protection in the afterlife. The concept of final destiny has always been a matter of contemplation and cultural variation. Buddhists and Hindus believe in reincarnation, where individuals are reborn into new bodies, living through continuous cycles of birth and death. Taoists view death with indifference as a form of non-action. Muslims believe in seven heavens, which are places of carnal pleasure and spiritual bliss. Many Jews believe in heaven, where good deeds are rewarded. Christians have a strong hope in heaven because of what Jesus Christ has done. 1 Peter 1, 3, 4 declares, 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. This passage reinforces the Christian hope in heavenly inheritance. Although we have the promise of a heavenly inheritance, much about heaven remains a mystery. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. This passage reminds us that while we now understand only a fraction of what is to come, one day we will have complete and clear understanding. The promise of the final destiny of believers is a source of great hope and comfort. While the New Testament does not provide many details about the intermediate state, it assures us that all believers, living or dead, belong to the Lord and will be with Him. Different cultures and religions have their own perspectives on death and the afterlife, but for Christians, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the guarantee of an imperishable and eternal inheritance in heaven. Until we have a full understanding, we live with the hope and certainty that one day we will see face to face and fully know what we now only glimpse. What right do you have to enter heaven? This is a question that everyone, without exception, will have to answer one day. Some people believe they have a guaranteed ticket to heaven for various reasons, but generally, these justifications fall into three main categories. The first one is, look at what I've done on earth. My track record is good compared to many. I've lived a very good life, so I'll be in heaven. However, this person is in trouble. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 Therefore, even if someone considers themselves exemplary in their actions, it's not enough. The Bible also states, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. James 2.10 In other words, there's no way to live a perfectly righteous life. The second common response is, I really don't know, and I'm not sure if I care. I thought about it for a while, but there were so many other things that seemed more important. This is a dangerous excuse, because as people often say, excuses get you nowhere. The Bible clarifies, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse, Romans 1.20. There's no escaping the reality of God and his judgment. The third correct response is to believe in Jesus Christ and accept him as your savior. Jesus is seated at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. It is only through him and his grace that we are able to enter heaven, not through our good deeds or noble acts on earth. And what about hell? Many people deny the existence of a place like hell, considering it a myth or an invention. However, the concept of hell is present in various cultures and religions throughout history. The Babylonians believed in the land of no return, the Hebrews wrote about Sheol, and the Greeks spoke of the underworld. Jesus was explicit in saying that unbelievers cannot escape the condemnation of hell. One of the most vivid descriptions of hell in the Bible is given by Jesus in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Hell is a controversial but essential subject in Christianity. Jesus stated that those who do not accept him as savior will be eternally banished from the presence of God. Although some advocate for universalism, the idea that everyone will eventually be saved, this contradicts the Bible. Scriptures teach that the soul exists eternally, whether saved or lost. Some believe that those who reject Jesus will simply cease to exist but this view lacks convincing biblical evidence. Others believe that God gives a second chance after death, but the Bible says otherwise. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. 
Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6, 2. We do not know when we will pass into eternity. The Bible teaches that there is a hell for anyone who intentionally and consciously rejects Christ as Lord and Savior. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, and if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. Matthew 5.29 Therefore, it is vital to recognize the seriousness of our choices and the urgent need to accept the salvation offered by Jesus Christ. Will a loving God send someone to hell? Jesus' response and biblical teachings give a clear and undeniable yes. However, it is important to understand that God does not willingly send anyone to hell. It is man himself who condemns to eternal hell because of his spiritual blindness, stubbornness, selfishness, and love for sinful pleasure. When a person rejects the path of salvation offered by God, they reject the hope of eternal life with him. Let's imagine a sick person going to the doctor. The doctor diagnoses the problem and recommends treatment, but the person ignores the advice. After a few days, they return to the doctor's office and say, it's your fault that I feel worse. Do something. God has prescribed the remedy for humanity's spiritual illness. The solution is personal faith and commitment to Jesus Christ, for the treatment is being born again. If we refuse this treatment, we will have to endure the terrible consequences of that choice. Yes, there is an alternative to heaven. No matter how you imagine it, we know it will be the separation from God and all that is holy and good. John Milton described it in Paradise Lost. A dungeon horrible on all sides round, as one great furnace flamed, yet from those flames no light but rather darkness visible, served only to discover sights of woe, regions of sorrow, doleful shades, where peace and rest can never dwell, hope never comes, that comes to all, but torture without end. On earth we tend to think of ourselves, but things will be different in heaven. We will experience the truth of the Catechism, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. In heaven, God, not man, will be at the center of everything and his glory will be paramount. Have you ever witnessed young couples in love communicating without words? Have you experienced the feeling of being in love? Those who are deeply in love find absolute joy in each other's company and often wish their moments together could last forever. If there were a way to freeze those moments and make time stand still, wouldn't that be heaven for them? Have you ever thought to yourself, I wish this moment could last forever? I believe these emotions are just glimpses of what it would be like to be frozen in time and to love God, delight in Him for eternity. We will never have to leave that experience behind. The Word of God assures us that heaven is a real place. Jesus told us, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. John 14, 2, 3. How should we live our lives in light of Christ's return? The Bible always presents the return of Christ as a great motivation to act, not as a reason to stop acting. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Paul concludes his teaching on the rapture by saying, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The apostles believed that Jesus could return in their lifetime. If they had stopped their work and waited, they would have disobeyed Christ's command to preach the gospel to the world. So they continued to serve and spread the gospel. Mark 16, 15 says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The apostles had a clear understanding that Jesus would return soon. This meant they had to dedicate themselves to doing God's work. They made the most of each day, living as if it were their last. We too should value each day as a gift from God and use it to bring glory to Him. 
The certainty of Christ's return should motivate us to live lives dedicated to serving God and loving others. Like the apostles, we should preach the gospel to all people and work diligently in the Lord's work, knowing that our labor is not in vain. Every day we have the opportunity to glorify God and enjoy His presence, both now and in eternity. Dear God, we thank you for your infinite mercy and love. We acknowledge that without the grace of Jesus Christ, we have no right to enter heaven. We ask you to help us live according to your commandments, steadfast and unwavering in your work, always preaching the gospel and spreading your love. Lord, help us remember that our true purpose is to glorify you and enjoy your presence forever. May each day be an opportunity to serve you and love others, living with the certainty of Christ's return. Thank you for the promise of an incorruptible inheritance in heaven. May we keep our hearts and minds focused on you, trusting in your word and seeking to live in a way that pleases you. In Jesus' name, our Savior, we pray. Amen.